live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We are all united. Well, uh, good morning, good night, good every 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 hour you are in your country, in your territory. Uh, it's for me and I think for us uh, a pleasure to uh, start this this discussion, this uh, sp space of reflection about the need to things, the way in which we develop a capacity building process and how uh, the communities uh, will be benefited by these uh, kind of uh, training processes that are uh, developed by them and for them. And uh, it's a pleasure to me to share this panel uh, with all these, these wonderful people that I have the opportunity to know in another processes. And I think with a very, very good panel today, I am happy to uh, to share with you these, these moments. So uh, we, uh, we want to uh, start with uh, an introduction about the topic, about uh, what perspective we, we want to have uh, about this, this this topic that, that we, we think it is very, very important to discuss and to develop the strategies and policies that uh, let us uh, make better uh, capacity building processes with the communities. So uh, I want to present first of all uh, to Lydia Chamorro. She's uh, a co organizer of, of this panel. And then uh, we will have uh, all, this, all the wonderful speakers that I will presented to you after that. So Lillian, the floor is yours. We can't hear you. Okay, now. Okay, good, good day for all of you. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, speak about this important topic that is the uh, building capacities for meaningful access to the internet. In this panel, we will discuss about the importance of building capacities for meaningful access. The internet and information and communication technologies have been designed and developed from the economic and power centers where applications, software standards, etc., have been created to suit the predominant mo development models. When we talk about communities outside this center, it is necessary to review the context and see how these technologies contribute to their development models, which are based on a diversity of practices, such as good living, agroecology, decentralization, community models, among others. Therefore, it is necessary to carry out processes of reflection and exchange of, of knowledge and experiences where the context problems and projects of each community, their values and priorities are identified. And this requires a flexible approach from the point of view of monitoring and public policies, which respond to these other realities with varied economic, social, and educational conditions. This process will result in regulations that help, that help to organize the diversity of initiatives that can be generated from the territories without conditioning the, these actions and practices of the communities themselves. Community networks are initiatives that differ from other connectivity strategies from the unconnected because it is the community themselves who install, operate, maintain, and manage the network. For this to happen, for communities to develop, to develop their own networks and connectivity projects, it's necessary to create training and capacity building processes to exchange knowledge and experiences that enable people in the communities to obtain the necessary knowledge and skills for the installation, maintenance, and operation of the networks in technical, organizational, and administrative issues. 
In this panel, we will reflect on the importance, challenge, and achievements of experience of training or capacity building programs linked to community networks, the goals, the challenge uh, that our, panel, our panelists have living in their processes. And now uh, they will uh, uh, um, uh, bring us more information and reflections about this topic. Uh, thank you to all for being here. Uh, Carlos, please, please present our panelists. Thanks, thanks a lot, Lilian. Lilian is right now in Colombia, is, and we are, and I am in Mexico, and all the other organized is in Dunge, who are in Kenya right now. So we are in different, very, very different parts of the world, and our panel is uh, also from different uh, parts of the world and also for different uh, kinds of training processes, very, very uh, different between them, but all uh, share this, uh, this characteristic to uh, train people that can, who can maintain, operate, install, and uh, expand their own networks. And this is very important to, uh, to understand for this panel. This is not uh, a, about uh, digital, uh, 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 another type of uh, training about the use of these technologies, but to understand how in the infrastructure works and how to maintain it and develop it. And in, in this panel, we, we have uh, a Rob, Rob McCannon, he uh, is from the uh, Alberta University in Canada, University of Alberta, sorry. And uh, he works in a project with adult, adult educators in the north of, of Canada uh, that uh, are right now training in, this, uh, in these topics. And uh, I want to ask him to start uh, with, with his presentation. Hi, hi everyone. Can you hear me okay? Great, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction, Carlos. Hi everyone. Um, I was wondering, can I share my screen? I have a few slides to go with my presentation today. Uh, do you have this? This uh, great. Or Thanks. you want to? Uh, uh, can you see okay? Great, thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to present today. Um, it's bright and early here in uh, in Canada. It's about twelve thirty, so uh, I haven't stayed up this late in a little while. So uh, I hope I can still present okay. Um, so yes, uh, just to introduce uh, the project here. Um, so it's called Digital NWT. Um, so I'm just one person out of a team of people working on this uh, presenting today. Um, and I'll be speaking about um, the project in Northern Canada, um, which is involving uh, Indigenous peoples uh, living in the Northern parts of the country. Um, I'm not an Indigenous person, I'm just a visitor on those territories and uh, honored and privileged to be able to work with people um, on this project. Um, so just introducing you to the land and the territories uh, that we're working with and the peoples who live there. Um, so this is the northern part of Canada. You can see on my left here, this is uh, kind of a map of Canada and the United States. So we're working in this area called the Northwest Territories. You can see it in green there. Um, and this is a very diverse region. So uh, it's known as Nunatsiaq by the uh, Inuvialuit, the Inuit peoples, um, who are kind of uh, living in this northern part of that territory. Uh, as well as Denede, which is um, the First Nations peoples that are living um, elsewhere in these different regions. Um, so if you look at these different colors and different parts of the territories, each of these are very diverse communities um, and nations uh, of Indigenous peoples um, that are uh, separated um, by, uh, so there are, many of them are in very small communities uh, that are only fly-in communities or maybe have ice roads that you can only access in parts of the year. Um, and so oftentimes, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, people are very 
reliant on telecommunication services to access public services, banks, et cetera, right? So these are quite small um, remote communities. This is just a photo in the middle of uh, the beautiful territories. It's not all mountainous like this. Some of it's like sort of flatter and uh, in the tundra and so on as you get further north. Um, and then on the right are just some uh, photos from uh, some of the people's activities, of course, like uh, tanning uh, moose and caribou hides at the top here. Um, uh, and then this is uh, on the bottom, it's uh, Kaladeche First Nation that made their own fiber optic community network. And just showing you, it can get pretty cold there. So when they're digging the trench to put their line, uh, they're working in uh, minus 40 degrees Celsius. So it can be quite, uh, quite cold up there. Um, so in terms of our project, um, here are some of the partners that we're working with. Um, so our project is uh, led by uh, four Indigenous uh, organizations from the different regions that I just shared about, uh, as well as us at the university and some uh, uh, educational institutions in the north. Um, and the focus is on um, uh, community-based digital literacy training, uh, whereby we use a train the trainer approach. So we work with communities and educate adult educators at the college um, to co-create uh, digital literacy courses on different topics and then um, share those materials on a free open access basis, uh, whereby they're taken up and taught inside these, these smaller communities. Um, so they range in topics from uh, the basics, you know, how to use devices, how to search the internet and so on, um, to things like digital storytelling, uh, data collection and community networks, which I'll talk about today. Um, so in terms of how we go about creating these courses, um, so we have like uh, teams of peer reviewers from the communities that give us feedback on them. Um, we also try to build a community. There's not a lot of internet access. I should have said that it's expensive, it's limited, and it's somewhat unreliable in many communities. But of course, social media uh, and so on is also very, uh, very popular. So we try to uh, do some uh, engagement there. Uh, and then as well, we're doing door-to-door -door household surveys where we're learning from people about what their self-reported levels of digital literacy are, as well as what types of topics that they're involved in. Um, and this is just on the on the left is a video of one of the adult educators talking about um, some of the uh, pro the um, project's resources. Um, this is something actually one of Carlos and I's uh, colleagues from Red A's, Maria Alvarez, uh, came up and and so we have friends in Mexico that we're working with on this project and uh, she introduced us to one of the the exercises they use whereby we kind of weave a network among uh, participants and then demonstrate that the internet's really about the connections between people rather than technology. Um, so just throw in a ball of yarn between us and then we understand that we're weaving a network there. Um, and then we did some uh, digital storytelling just to um, really demonstrate what people, um, uh, the storytelling aspects of uh, digital literacy, how you can put together words, uh, images, and uh, and sound into short digital stories whereby people could talk about why they're interested in technologies, what some of their concerns are, what some of their hopes are, and so on. Um, we also tried in the curriculum to profile local digital innovators. So this would range, uh, for example, JC here uh, on the bottom is doing a um, language revitalization campaign using social media. It's a hashtag speak Gwich'in to me, Gwich'in is her language. Um, so we try to showcase some of the work she's doing, as well as people working on uh, community networks, such as Sidoni Okina uh, on the right here, who's working with the Internet Society uh, to set up a, a community network in her community of Ulu Haktak. Um, we're right now working to actually build up a course um, whereby we're looking at um, uh, the process of planning and then demonstrating community networks. Um, so we have some different exercises that we work through with people in the communities. Um, so for example, here on the left, you can see uh, an exercise where they uh, have like a tabletop, almost like a board game, where they have 3D printed pieces of different aspects of infrastructure, different houses, uh, resources, and so on, like hospitals, schools. They place those on a map of their own community. So each community has a map. And then they wire that up with a ball of yarn to show how it connects. And the idea behind this to help them visualize what a community network is and kind of build a model of it. Uh, and then we are working with a, a group called Wacoma Technologies on their Nimble kit, 
um, which is a, a offline first mesh networking technology. And because of COVID, we couldn't visit these communities in person. So we worked with people in the communities to try to uh, geographically distribute the manufacturing of these units. So they're kind of little kits that uh, we have 3D printed shelving and then you put the components in the shelving, which we can see in the middle here. And then you would build a small scale demonstration met mesh network. So these are ubiquity uh, access points. And then we preload that with some content and uh, services that people could use offline so they don't have to connect to the rest of the internet. Um, am I okay for a few more minutes? I don't wanna take up too much time here. Yes, you want, you have uh, one, two minutes more. Sure, okay. Um, so just uh, uh, the last thing I'll talk about is, um, I mentioned that, so we, we're looking at community networks as kind of an alternative to uh, some of the limitations of the internet connectivity available in these communities. Uh, and one thing we've learned from talking to people there is the limitations in data and information uh, about their level of connectivity. So I mentioned that these are very small uh, remote communities, geographically remote communities. So we've been working with them to try to collect information about their levels of connectivity um, with the goal of um, pointing out to policymakers and regulators um, uh, about the, the gaps in universal access. Um, so we're using some uh, user generated tests such as uh, on the right here, this is uh, based on the MLAB model um, in the US, um, adopted in Canada by a group called the Canadian Internet um, Registration Authority. So people can run a dashboard uh, where they click and, and measure their internet speed and then it plots it on a map. Um, so we did some campaigns uh, to try to encourage people to run the test. Uh, and the final thing I'll mention is we've been uh, adapting and using the open data kit um, uh, platform uh, using uh, Android tablets and then having people do household surveys to try to collect some more information on levels of connectivity. Um, so uh, people kind of go through our training and then they um, gain some uh, introductory um, uh, um, kind of expertise and, and uh, experience in uh, local um, data collection for topics related to uh, technology and uh, digital literacy. And the last thing I'll say in my presentation is that we try to take this information from the folks we're learning alongside in the communities and then present this back to the policymakers. Uh, so in Canada, the, the regulator, which is a CRTC or Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission is currently looking at the state of telecommunications in the North, but there's a big gap in available information. And so um, we're working with our partners uh, in the communities to try to um, collect some information there on what it's what the services are like in these uh, areas at the same time as, as working to build community networks. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for, for um, hearing me today. And uh, yeah, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Rob, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, maybe we can start to highlight some, some things that I think it is important. For example, you talk about uh, the content, the local content and how to do, it's important to link it with infrastructure and other uh, digital platforms. You, can, you also talk about uh, how this uh, training about technologies is inserted in other processes like these adult educators, uh, uh, the work that they develop in the north of Canada, and in a specific with different kinds of cultures. And also uh, uh, something that it is important is how you uh, manage these uh, challenges to train people in, uh, in COVID times. So uh, with different methodologies and, and different imaginations, and also with collaboration, uh, very important collaborations about technical issues and pedagogical issues like this collaboration with Wacoma and the Nimble, I think it is very, very important also to highlight. So thanks a lot, Rob. And then I want to present you uh, Ronda. Ronda, is, 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 I hope to, uh, to pronounce it well, is Ronda says Leslie Green. And uh, she works in uh, ISOC, Internet Society, uh, developing the uh, training strategy and uh, they are doing a wonderful job 
for example, to uh, develop an online platform, platform uh, to help people to train them, themselves and uh, to structure a whole uh, training strategy from ISOC there. So Rhonda, uh, it's very nice to have you here and the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carlos. Welcome everyone. Good morning, good evening, good night, maybe in the case of Rob. Um, we're really glad to, to have you here. Um, and this is a, a topic near and dear to my heart. So I'm actually looking forward to hearing the other speakers. So I'll share my slides just now and start my timer as well. So if you hear my timer go off and I stop abruptly so that I, I don't, take over the time for everyone else. So um, as Carlos mentioned, my name is Dr. Rhonda Jelesny Green, uh, and I'm the Global Head of Training and E-Learning at the Internet Society. Uh, and what I want to focus on today um, is building on the theme of this session itself is how we are doing things at the Internet Society to help people move from knowledge acquisition to community-based action. Um, this is something that the Internet Society has been doing long before I arrived, um, but when I joined the organization in January of 2020, um, one of my focuses was on making sure that we were staying true um, to this idea of action and not just learning for the sake of learning. So um, for those of you who may not know, uh, the Internet Society is a global nonprofit working to ensure that the Internet of Opportunity benefits all. Um, next year, we're actually turning 30. So we were founded in 1992 by uh, many of the, the founders of the Internet. And since then, um, and from the beginning, education has kind of been coded in our DNA. So in some way, shape or form since 1992, we've been engaged um, in education efforts. And those efforts have been um, instrumental to, to reaching many, many people around the world. In fact, um, at least since 2013, when the digital component of our training um, and e-learning work was, was launched, our e-learning work, um, we reached over 100,000 people. And um, I'm happy to, to also note that at, at present, we've reached almost 9,000 people in this year alone um, with, with the work that we do. So um, with that in mind, I want to, to get in a little bit to our approach and, and what it is that we do exactly. Um, so as I mentioned, the Internet Society has been engaged in training and e-learning for quite some time. Um, and one of the mandates that I had when I joined was to kind of reimagine our learning. And as you might imagine, by the time I told you that I joined the organization in January 2020, uh, once the pandemic um, went worldwide, that it meant that I had to reimagine um, even our training and e-learning in every sense of the word. So one of the ways that I've done that is take Taking an approach to do an end-to-end -end rebuild um, of all of our courses. So if any of you are familiar with the Internet Society, then you know some of our most popular courses include building wireless community networks. They also include um, our courses on network operations. Um, but we're also uh, well known for our course that we offer on internet governance. And in fact, um, in the past uh, in the past year, we have partnered with several um, internet governance forums in different countries um, and also in different regions around the world to help make sure that people have the latest up-to-date knowledge and skills that they need to be able to take action in their community. And when we say action, uh, we mean that can be technical action. So, you know, helping to, to do things um, related to network operations or global routing security. We also mean the business aspects of this. So our IXPs course, which will launch next year, um, is going to focus not just on the technical components of IXPs, but also the business, the social sustainability, which a lot of people tend to forget about whenever they're doing international development projects that involve technology. If it doesn't work socially from a sustainability standpoint, it will never fly. Um, separate from this, we are also in the process of working with our long-term partner uh, IEEE on redeveloping our community networks course. And next year, we're actually going to have 
two um, uh, courses related to community networks. One is going to be about building community networks and the other is going to be about um, a community assessment so that people can understand you know, how, whether, if at all, they should be developing community, community networks where they live. And then separate from that, we also encourage people to take action related to advocacy. So um, our courses in our, our advocacy section are some of the most popular that we have. Um, encryption, which was boosted by our Global Encryption Day that we, we helped facilitate in October. All of these things are equipping people to take action from day one. So, um, what is different about what we do and why have we been able to achieve um, the, the success and reach that we have? Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of uh, personally as someone who is neurodiverse is that all of our courses um, are now made accessible, um, including mobile accessible. So um, my PhD, if, if you know anything about it, was in mobile learning. So that was one of, <clears throat> one of the things that I wanted to change because we know now, although we suspected then based on feedback um, that mobile was a huge vehicle for people to, to join our courses. And we're seeing um, rates of about 90% of people who are learning with their mobile phones. So we're putting a, a, mobile, for, a mobile first approach um, forward and also making sure that everyone can learn with us no matter their abilities. Um, and then we also engage um, a community of practitioners. So um, although some of our courses are self-paced, the majority Majority of them are moderated by tutors, and these are people in the community. Some of them have formerly worked in government. Some of them are currently involved in internet society chapters. Some of them are currently still working either in the public or private sector in the areas that our topics are covered by. Um, we also make sure that we are updating the content every year so that people come with the latest and, and greatest knowledge. And one of the things that we did um, that we've started this year as well um, is a partnership with the university to, to obtain micro credentials for our courses and then also to get in industry backing from the nearly 80 um, members that we have at the Internet Society itself. Um, so our approach, um, as I mentioned, uh, particularly when we do face-to-face -face work, is a, a substantial community engagement. And I know that was part of the reason that, that Carlos invited me here, because we have a long-standing partnership um, with, with him and his colleagues, not only at the APC, um, but, but at other organizations that are doing work in, in the area of community development, focusing on technology and particularly the infrastructure. Um, I'm, <clears throat> from what I'm <clears throat> told, in the past year we had, I think it was about seven at least new internet exchange points that, that launched across Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, we kind of measure our success in the outputs in terms of not just who the people that we reach, but also in terms of the, the impact that we have in terms of growing um, the internet infrastructure. And so um, my kind of call to action to all of you, if you want to get involved and want to su support our work, we really welcome that. And I was so delighted to see what Rob presented as well, since a lot of our work also um, occurs with Northern uh, Indigenous communities. And each year we have an Indigenous Connectivity Summit. So I'll end there, just short of my, my time. Um, but if you have any questions, happy to take them at the end if we have time for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, Rhonda, also for a wonderful presentation. And to uh, very, very quickly explain all the job that, uh, as you said, uh, ISOC has been doing for 30 years and how, why uh, this experience is important to uh, the action that you are doing right now. And I think uh, you, you, you mentioned a very important thing that it is how uh, through this we can uh, make possible actions in the communities. How, how this uh, transforming practical uh, uh, solutions for their needs or for their uh, plans and objectives. And I think th th this question is very interesting and we, we can uh, try to think about it in the rest of the panel. Thanks a lot, Ronda. No problem, uh, thank you, Carlos. Uh, and then I, I want to present you uh, uh, Roxana with Mary Jesku, 
Roxana works in uh, ITU. Uh, she is a she, senior uh, in the Office of Digital Inclusion and uh, is focal point for indigenous people for uh, uh, sorry, accessibility, I should say accessibility and other, other persons. And uh, we are doing a lot of job also with them. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Roxana. Thank you very much, Carlos, and good morning, everyone. Um, well, um, first of all, we are talking about meaningful access. So um, I will just, with your permission, let's try to step back a little bit and um, try to see exactly what it is meaningful connectivity. So. We know from some definition that is a framework to track the components of connectivity that matters most for all user and help also decision makers to adopt the policies needed to connect people to an internet that is useful and empowering. From the experience that we have here in, in ITU, um, in the development sector, actually, of ITU, we are working for, as Carlos mentioned, for over 20 years in digital inclusion of all people, regardless of their gender, age, ability, or location. My question would be, how to access this internet? Is this connectivity enough? And how to arrive from the access to the use of internet. And with your permission, I would like to share what for us, it's the six A's which are compulsory to enable us all to arrive to this empowerment of people through, through technology. So first of all, when we talk about access in ITU, we talk about connectivity. And um, is this access enough to, to say that the people are connected, that they can use internet? So for us, the second pillar, it will be affordability. And this affordability will enable people from one hand to, to pay the internet or to be able to, to access to this uh, internet connectivity, but also to the device. And then the key word for us is accessibility. And the accessibility is it's different from affordability. Sometimes people um, use the access to internet thinking to the affordability, but the accessibility is about the use, the usability of, of the technology. And for us, the accessibility has another three A's, which is adoption of policies, is the accessible ICTs like, like the smart technology. So the ICTs that can be used by everyone who have embedded accessibility feature from the design uh, stage of fabrication. And of course, what we are talking today, capacity building. So alphabetization, capacity building, and even beyond what we call adoption, because we make a difference between being um, skilled or adopt the technology. So the, the fact that people are using naturally and go to technology to, uh, to, to be used. So from here, we know that capacity building, so it's education and enable us to access information and information is power. And education is also a life process. And I just want, I, I have for you a very nice quote from Alvin um, Toffler. Um, and I mentioned here because he, he was an American writer, but he was a futurist and a businessman known for his work discussing modern technologies, including the digital revolution and the communication revolution with emphasis of their effects in cultures worldwide. And he said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And I was quoting. So um, with this in mind, uh, for us in, in, in the development sector of the ITU, 
the capacity building is an investment in the effectiveness and future sustainability of, of the people. And uh, if we, if I make reference to, to the a training program that we established already since 2005, the Taylor One training program from indigenous community, we say that when capacity building is successful, um, it strengthens an ability to fulfill its mission over time. And thereby, in, in this case, is enhancing the, the indigenous um, communities' uh, possibility to, to have an impact in the life of, uh, of the people. And there is a lot of nice story to say, but I only want to, to focus in one. Uh, after the years, we realize that regardless of all our efforts, we are not necessarily very successful, regardless of the number. The numbers were very successful, but I, I would like to talk in terms of quality. So, and why we didn't manage from the very beginning to, to achieve this is because um, we, we didn't really involve indigenous people and indigenous knowledge and indigenous needs from the very beginning of our training program. And um, with the help of, uh, of experts uh, who dedicate their life to, to work in indigenous community like, uh, like Carlos here present, we arrived to the conclusion that uh, quantity is very important. So to train indigenous people on how to use technology to, to achieve their social and economic development or for a specific uh, activity, uh, we realize that some key issue here are, um, let's say, self-sustainability and how to develop a training program for, in this case, it was for technical promoters in telecommunication and broadcasting in indigenous communities who can later on uh, be part of the community knowledge. And we were quite reluctant because it's a huge investment and the numbers are, are quite small because require a, a whole year program. But this was actually the most, uh, I would say valuable training that we managed to do uh, in this uh, 17 years um, by now. So um, I would say in short that um, from our experience, um, the most important thing that we have to keep in mind is that from time to time, we cannot see immediately big numbers or big results. But if we, um, if we consider uh, self-sustainability, social economic development, and concrete targets like how to help a community to really enable them access what they need, what they really are interested to, and how to tailor this capacity building program to their own interest, uh, I, I do believe in this case would be preservation of cultural heritage, access to education, job opportunities, or whatever uh, other. And we put the right pillars. Uh, I do believe even if the result is not immediately um, um, visible, I do believe is the right way to go. And with your permission, I would also uh, like to share a very short video. It's only two minutes in which um, we try in, in few words to, to put a whole story of, uh, of 15 years of work in which we try to leave no one behind and to respect everyone's um, needs, aspirations, goals, culture, and to adapt technology to be human-centered and to adapt technology in a way that people really want to embrace technology and be empowered with. So Carlos, can you share this video? And of course, I'm all yours for whatever additional um, 
information or detail with about our training courses or whatever uh, other work that I do is doing in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Roxana. Yes, I can share the video. Just Leaving no one behind means ensuring that technology is people-centered and develops from the bottom up, in compliance with universal design and catering for the abilities and needs of all communities, including those of the elderly and indigenous peoples. Muchas veces eh, estas tecnologías llegan como a, a posicionarse en, dentro de las comunidades sin considerar mucho las formas propias, ¿no? De, de saber, de sentir, de conocer, de intercambiar. Digital inclusion is a goal in itself and also a powerful enabler. When technology is built and deployed, considering the needs and values of these communities, it could become a transformative voice for cultural preservation, self-determination and empowerment. Este, este proceso de formación aporta a mi comunidad a través de mi persona los conocimientos de alguna manera básicos ¿no? de entrada de inicio para que no tengamos como comunidad que estar eh, dependiendo de alguien más sobre todo de fuera technology needs to be put into the hands of the people who are going to use it but for that training and capacity building are key ITU, in collaboration with other institutions, has been carrying out comprehensive training programs for indigenous peoples, and in so fulfilling the mandate of its members and stakeholders. Lo que queremos lograr es una visión crítica de las tecnologías, conocimiento sobre cómo manejarlas, para después apropiarlas y transformarlas en la medida en la que la comunidad quiere solucionar temas o lograr los sueños que se han propuesto. Want to know more? Visit our website, partner with us, and let us work together to leave no one behind and no one offline. Muchas gracias, Carlos. Thanks a lot, Roxana. Uh, and yeah, we, we will open a new call for this uh, program. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't know why, what happened here. It is, yeah, it's okay. Uh, the, we will open a new call for this uh, training program in the beginning of the next year. So uh, we'll be attentive for this. And uh, I hope in the future we can also work in another training program similar for another regions. So thanks a lot, Roxana. I, I think you. just want to highlight uh, two things that you share with us. One of these things is this all these uh, uh, definitions of what a meaningful connectivity need, needs to be understand more beyond the connectivity itself. And also the education as a life process. Uh, if we understand that, we also understand that the technologies is also something that uh, make better or worse the life processes for the people and in the in the if, if the technologies are uh, appropriated and are uh, developed by the people itself uh, it can be uh, very good because they they uh, can be uh, sustain their life in their own ways to to do it and and to live better with the technologies too so our goal is definitely to to empower people so we do we do hope that the technology should be deployed as i told uh, before being human centered considering the needs be adapted to the people uh, to the requirements to the interest and um, there is no um, there is no sense 
to use the technology to harm people, we want to empower them. So let's try to, to find the right approach and to ensure that we empower people through technology. Thanks a lot, Roxana. Uh, I want to send some uh, greetings from, from here to the people who are in Poland. Uh, I can, we can see, see you sit there in the, in the room. And also a, a special greeting to the Uganda Remote Hub. It's a pleasure to you select us to, to be here. So a greetings from, from here, from Mexico. Here is a three in the morning. So it's also very early, uh, but we are very happy to, to be here with you. Uh, the next speaker is also, uh, I think, a very interesting process. Uh, she's a risper. Um, Nianbok, and she works in a Tunapanda Network, in the, the, a project from the Tunapanda Institute in Kenya, and uh, they are doing with uh, with another organization that we we are uh, working with uh, in Locknet, the initiative from APC and Rizomatica to develop their own uh, national schools for uh, community networks. So the next two speakers, the, uh, she and Gustav, uh, will be talking about this process in which they are uh, designing and thinking how to develop a, a contextualized and a very meaningful uh, training process in their country. So RISPER is a pleasure to have you here and see you. I can see you right now. Thank you so much, uh, Carlos. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here. And uh, I feel very, very honored to share this moment with all of you in the room and in this space to just talk about our experiences and what we've learned uh, so far with the process. So uh, I'd really like, I've, I've really loved the presentations that have already happened because they um, sort of speak uh, speak to uh, my presentation and just um, summarizes like the whole um, purpose of uh, why we are doing what we are doing. And just to add on to like uh, to what Roxana has just mentioned uh, in terms of uh, technology being a really huge part in when it's in the hands of the community themselves and not us handing it down to, to the community. It's not a top down, but it's a bottom up approach. And there's something interesting I came, I, I came across that says connectivity is only good for those with devices. The devices are only good to those who have the knowledge to use them. And I think that is where this whole work of um, um, other than just connectivity, how else, how can we meaningfully participate in the online space? And uh, how can we better use our uh, technology to um, also boost our socioeconomic uh, status, to boost our knowledge uh, and skills to be very, very competitive in uh, this competitive world, ideally. So, <clears throat> I had wanted to share that uh, before um, I, I jump into uh, what, what my, my presentation. So um, we have been doing a couple of uh, things uh, with regards to this training. It's actually, um, um, it started in, in, in 2020 uh, where we met with Carlos and the team to just learn on the alternative way of uh, capacity building the communities that we engage with. Um, so that had, uh, that got us, we had already, we were already uh, using our own processes in training, but then getting people to uh, use the participatory action research uh, methodology to, to uh, engage the different communities that, that we were training and also engage the different community networks uh, around Kenya so that we have a, uh, um, knowledge um, and also we have documentations of the work that we are doing for easy uh, for easy learning and easy exchanges. So uh, in 2020, last year we started with scenario building, just um, planning on how this training would look like, and also um, 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 the 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 work, work, work two team that is Carlos and 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 his team shared with us a guide 
to just help us understand what it means to have a human-centered design um, in um, creating the training processes and engaging the community from the own go um, of, of training of, of creating these training processes. So thinking when thinking through it, uh, engaging the community. Uh, in the design phase, in the implementation phase, and also just um, uh, when evaluating the entire processes. So um, after scenario phase, uh, scenario scenario building, we did um, seeing phase where we mapped out the different community networks in, in Kenya. Initially, we, we got four, but our goal was to get seven community networks. And um, once we had already mapped them out, we did um, we did an interview with all the community networks just to understand where they are, what their community networks are doing, um, what are some of the successes that they, they've experienced, challenges, and also best practices that they've been applying, and mostly uh, what are the training needs for some of the training areas that they would have loved to be trained on. Uh, and from that, we came up with a report um, on, on that data, which is actually the thinking phase where we, we just analyze what they talked about, came up with that report that summarizes all the training needs, the experiences, and then from there, <coughs> sorry, from there we, um, um, we um, narrowed down because they, there was a lot of training needs that came from, from that uh, interview. So we narrowed it down to core areas we came up with eight core areas that we, we are training the community networks on. Uh, just to mention them, we are training them on community and community networks. There is one on policy and regulation, sustainability and financial management. We also have organizational processes and structures of our community networks. Uh, there's also policy and regulation. Um, we will also be training them on um, sustainability and uh, of course the connectivity bit, which is the network infrastructure. So how we have um, arranged uh, this process is we have mentorships, online mentorships that have been ongoing since October this year. And what we are doing there is inviting experts from different region, uh, from, from different places, both locally and, and global, from the glo global space to just come and speak about these experiences and mostly speak about them from the experiences, uh, from, from when they started it and how they've been, um, they've been facing issues or handling or tackling challenges. So at this, at the mentorship bit is not more of information share, um, um, it's not more of uh, tackling the problem at hand, but just uh, creating that space for everyone to share their experiences. So once the expert shares, uh, the, <coughs> the community networks are able to ask questions and also just to find, um, get their, um, uh, their understanding more, or, uh, but also like in terms of what has been happening on ground. And then from the data that we got there, it will now help us to create a national school of community networks, where now we invite uh, a network um, experts. Actually, we have formed an advisory committee, which um, constitute of experts, constitute of the uh, uh, community networks representatives themselves, uh, just talking and elaborating more on these uh, issues that have been raised um, through the research and also through the mentorship. From that, we, we, we are creating curriculum that are quite uh, uh, vast in terms of uh, the coverage. And uh, we are also glad that we are partnering with uh, ISOC in, in doing so. So just creating curriculum that resonates with the needs of the community networks. And also um, uh, a curriculum that responds to, 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 their, to their different needs. Uh, it's, 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 it's a very interesting process because as, as we're also interacting with them, we are realizing that there are um, curriculum that already exist. And so we don't need to replicate energy. It's just a matter of, um, um, 
strengthening that um, strengthening or refining or adding on to to what already exists so that is in terms of the mentorship and the the advisory committee that that we we are looking forward uh, to to creating so something also that uh, we are doing right now is we actually at the moment we have all the community networks we've come to the coastal region of kenya and we are having our first exchange. So this is the first time the community networks are, are meeting each other. And um, so the main purpose of our travel to, to, to the coastal region of Kenya was to visit one of the C, the community, one of the community network. It's it's called Dunia Moja Community Network, uh, headed by Twahir. So he has posted us here in, in the coastal region. And um, it's been it's been quite um uh, interesting so far and fun. So the first day when we got here, we went for boat riding, had team bonding, just people to get to know each other, to just share with each other before now uh, getting into the sessions. Um, I don't know, we have a couple of photos that we can, we can share. Carlos? Thank you. So this is a, the setup of where we we are at the moment and uh, we've been having different conversations uh, since the first day we got here um, so like um, yesterday we were training on uh, community and community network and just uh, looking at the access bit um, 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 uh, community whereby we were talking about community networks uh, and not just implying more on the access, but also uh, there is the aspect of organizational and technological management processes in favor of, of their dreams, desires, needs, and process of the communities in which they are developed. And uh, for us, creating and managing community net network is not just a technical matter, but a way of using, appropriating, and transforming communication communication tools in a particular territory with their ways of life, development, objective, culture, and its own identity. And this process has just brought that into life. Um, so that was the first day, which was yesterday. Today, we are doing more of a, a con uh, deployment. So we are doing site visits um, to the different areas um, that will be deploying the um, uh, as one of our goals, we were to deploy uh, Wi-Fi hotspots around the, the area. So that is uh, what we'll be doing uh, today, the whole of today. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Carlos. So those are like some of the photos of just the sessions uh, ongoing. Um, so we definitely feel like this is a very good uh, process in bringing everyone together in uh, creating meaningful content that enables us to create meaningful community networks and also create meaningful uh, network for, for the community themselves. So um, I'm very happy to, to see what we have for the next upcoming days and also just to, to learn more on uh, what the rest of the speakers have in store for us. So thank you so much, uh, Carlos, and back to you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Risper. I, I, I think uh, it's very interesting how you are address this uh, challenge of design a, a school of community networks that uh, faced the uh, needs, dreams, ways of learning, ways of sharing knowledge uh, in the communities uh, that you are work with. And, uh, and also how we need to think beyond the workshops or, or beyond the specific activities and more to think on a comprehensive program with a, with other type of, of capacity building like the mentorships and also this uh, advisory committee and everything you are doing uh, there. And also uh, another thing that I think it is shared with uh, all the examples that we, we we had in this in this panel is that uh, it's important to make networks between the people to make these spaces to let people uh, encounter the, their self and share their dreams and share their problems and make it possible to make a networks 
of technician or people who know how to uh, manage and uh, maintain and their own network. So thanks, thanks a lot, Prisper. Uh, and also uh, send my greetings to the people who are right now in this in this process there. Uh, also, I, I want to uh, present you the, the final speaker of the panel. Uh, he's, he's Gustav, uh, Gustav Hariman Iskandar, and uh, he is from Indonesia, and uh, he works in Common Room, an organization who also works uh, right now with community networks, and also they are uh, developing their own uh, National School of Community Networks, and they, uh, they have another training program that it is very important, that is the Rula ICT camp. But I let Gustav to share with us all this, this process and reflection. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you are in the good health, uh, despite of uh, very challenging uh, situations that we have uh, at the moment. I will try to share some of our uh, story from Indonesia, uh, developing a local community network as well as uh, establishing the School of Community Networks uh, with a lot of uh, interesting challenges, uh, but as well uh, opportunities. Uh, let me share some of uh, a picture. So, uh, yeah, I think the uh, same like everyone uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, outbreak, internet connectivity is already uh, an essential uh, tool uh, dealing with our daily life, uh, not only for um, uh, communications, but also for many uh, 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 aspects. And in Indonesia, even though that uh, uh, we have a quite uh, significant, significant growth in uh, internet uh, penetrations in uh, many regions in Indonesia, but the digital divide are still a real um, challenge uh, for us in uh, general. Uh, some of these uh, challenges uh, primarily confront, uh, confront with many uh, 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 components and issues ranging from the absence of basic internet infrastructure, uh, geographical challenge, because Indonesia is very big, uh, so many islands, uh, remote places, and so on. Uh, and there are uh, differences in bandwidth, bandwidth costs between Java and uh, out of Java Island. Uh, and there are so many uh, other uh, reasons why a digital uh, divide is a real uh, challenge in Indonesia which include a uh, lack of digital skills and gender gap. Uh, digital skill in that in Indonesia is quite low based on a report made by our government. And uh, the community networks is part of strategy to support, uh, develop and consolidate uh, citizen initiative in developing the uh, community-based internet infrastructure in their uh, region. This um, initiative is part of the digital access program as well as uh, uh, initiative that we are uh, developed together uh, with APC uh, to address the digital divide uh, challenges in Indonesia. Uh, apart from digital divide, I think um, in, globally speaking, we have uh, a lot of uh, similarities in terms of common challenges. In Indonesia, we have quite huge uh, population growth, for example, as well as increasing gap in uh, development between rural, urban and rural areas. And we also experiencing the impact of climate change as well as uh, the latest uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, outbreak. And in West Java alone, uh, it is uh, predicted we are going to have uh, 100 million people uh, in 2045. So it's going to be, well, some people um, say it's going to be a, like a benefit, uh, but uh, this is going to be a, a from, from a, some perspective is going to be also a grow uh, population uh, challenge uh, uh, as well. And digital divide is not only in Indonesia, but in West Java. West Java is one of the most populated uh, province in Indonesia. And we still experience the uh, digital divide uh, challenges, especially in the southern coastal uh, area where we are uh, focusing our uh, initiative uh, at the moment. So what is community networks? Uh, based on our understanding, community networks is basically uh, local internet infrastructure that are 
made by people for the people and used uh, and utilized by the uh, for the people. And we have a certain framework for this. Uh, it has to be legal, which means comply with the existing um, policy and regulations. Uh, it should, uh, it, uh, the internet also have to be uh, safe, a safe space for everyone. It should, uh, should be affordable and uh, meaningful. Uh, and in, in, in regards to uh, develop the local uh, community-based internet infrastructure, we developing uh, some kind of a framework, but which we call it uh, 5L, uh, which stands for low tech, uh, low energies, because in uh, rural areas, uh, sometimes we have problems with energy supply. It should be low maintenance. It should be to be easy for everyone to uh, look at. And uh, everyone should be um, have an access to learn how to uh, build it. And uh, local support is one of the main uh, important uh, aspect uh, from this uh, framework. And what we are understand about meaningful communication is uh, it should be uh, directly related with uh, some uh, agenda that if it, that is important for us, for example, uh, to improve public services, uh, developing a platform for remote educations, uh, health services, and COVID-19 pandemic response, and so on, and so on. And uh, the School of Community Networks, actually, the, uh, the cross-cutting uh, uh, approach in, in, in order to deal with uh, existing uh, digital divide challenges, in especially in rural areas and remote places in Indonesia. So we focusing our effort in developing curricula and training materials that are uh, directly uh, engaged with policy and regulations, uh, human rights and gender equality, uh, digital literacy, as well as uh, internet for innovation in terms of uh, improving public education. Locations, COVID-19 pandemic response uh, to improve our education uh, process as well as economic recovery and uh, to support the local knowledge and content production and distributions to make internet more uh, relevant for uh, many uh, people in our uh, country. And this is the two locations that uh, are uh, uh, we are uh, working at the moment. Uh, the first is in the Kasapuan uh, Ciptaglar Indigenous Community, uh, and the other one is in Ciracap uh, District. Both is uh, located in the southern coastal areas of West Java. And we develop a multi-stakeholder collaboration for this, involving government, civil society organizations, education sector, uh, private sector, as well as international partners like uh, APC and um, FCDO, including SIDA and ITU. So this is the School of Community Network Development uh, locations at the moment uh, from the uh, 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 northern part of uh, Sumatra in uh, Aceh. This is like the, the, the margin uh, area uh, of Indonesia to uh, Papua. So there are several locations and there are several additional uh, locations and how we uh, decided to work in these locations is uh, by uh, many input uh, either from the board of advisors of uh, School of Community and Work as well as some uh, partner organizations that uh, closely uh, working with us like uh, ICT Watch and uh, ICT, uh, Indonesia National ICT Volunteer uh, Network. So this is some of the activities that we are organized. Uh, we actually try to do an online workshop, but uh, based on our experience, face-to-face uh, uh, -face and on-site uh, workshop activities is more impactful, even though it was quite challenging during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, situation. So we have to comply with the COVID-19 uh, prevention protocols in order to uh, do this. And yeah. This is some of the activity. We uh, do workshop with teachers, with uh, uh, citizens, with youth communities, and so on. Okay, thank you. Back to you, Thanks, thanks, thank, thank, Gustav. I think uh, your experience are, are also very, very, very interesting. And uh, because uh, a lot of things, but 
especially I like very much these five L's uh, to understand uh, meaningful connectivity, how we need to uh, develop low tech, uh, local support, low uh, energy, low maintenance, and low learning curve. So if we can achieve that and we, we focus on that, I think the training process in, in specific technical issues will be very, very, uh, very, very nice. And we will have uh, a very uh, good processes. And also if we link that with another processes like the legal, the, the economic, the uh, educational, and the old process uh, that uh, communities lead, it is very, very uh, important to understand the whole panorama to, uh, to develop uh, meaningful training programs for meaningful access and connectivity. So thanks a lot, Gustavo. So uh, this is uh, now the time to uh, open the floor to uh, have some questions, comments, be sharing experience and other experiences of training. So uh, just please raise your, raise your hand or take the mic in the, in the room in Poland. So we are happy to, to listen to you. Yeah. Hi. Can I go first? <laughs> uh, hi. Um, my name is Shano Shokru. Um, I've been active in uh, community networks and community media for a long time, but I've really appreciated the presentations. I think everybody here has. They've been really fantastic, enlightening, and it's so great to see so many things happening in uh, different parts of the world. Uh, in fact, I hope to be able to visit a number of you uh, because I am currently doing an evaluation for APC Rhizomatica and CEDA of the LockNet project that's been mentioned there a couple of times. So it's been a brilliant opportunity for me to actually uh, at least see you face to face and to learn more about the projects. So I, I just wanted to ask um, a couple of questions because this evaluation really is about seeing, it, it's about looking at the environment for uh, community networks um, and what is needed to kind of expand the movement into something more. And I was struck by the contrast between uh, Kenya and Indonesia, for instance, both of which I hope to visit over the next couple of months. You might know it, but that's the case. I'll be asking you um, in the near future. Um, and, and I'm wondering uh, in Kenya, for instance, uh, the questions that I would have there immediately are, what do you think is needed to expand what's going on in community networks uh, into new communities? I was delighted to hear there were six or seven, I think, communities, uh, community networks going of different kinds, but both in terms of motivating uh, communities, in terms of um, uh, building their knowledge about these possibilities, but also on the other side, in terms of uh, regulation, financing, policy, that kind of stuff. So what are the main barriers, but what are the main opportunities and what would be needed? Um, and then uh, if I could ask Gustav, um, in, in Indonesia, a similar question, but it's obviously a very, very different situation in Indonesia where it seems to be, I hesitate to say top down. I don't mean top down, it's a bottom up process, but nevertheless, there is a support for a program here to do this. And, but I do have the same question still as to, are there limits to that kind of a, a expansion into communities? And what would be the, what actions could be taken and are you taking uh, to extend that network into different areas? So that's two questions, one for RISPR and one for uh, Gustav. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, thanks Sean. We can uh, put together two or three uh, questions. We have another in the room and uh, we have also the Uganda remote group. Uh, they hang, you hang, they hang up. So the one in the room and then the uh, Uganda remote hub. Yes, uh, thank you very much. My name is Wisdom Donko. I'm from Ghana. And then the president and CEO of Africa Open Data and uh, Internet Research Foundation. Um, I have a couple of interventions. Um, the first one uh, is uh, for 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 us in the developing for us in the developing countries uh, to be able to succeed in um, initiatives such as yours, I think there are one or two things that we need to uh, consider when it comes to uh, community network. The first one is um, 
we have to look at the role of a central government um, in planning this, but <clears throat> ultimate implementation should be by local government in collaboration with local communities and leaders. Uh, most often we see uh, people coming from the developed world, coming to the, uh, our communities to initiate such a good uh, program. But then we realize that um, they come with all their expertise and then uh, they implement what they have to do. And then when they leave, the project dies off. Uh, so we need to look at that. The number two is um, one size fits all approach from the global world does not work in the developing world, but incentives transfer transfer of skills, um, uh, knowledge and all that is another key. Uh, what we are also realizing is that uh, you come to the developing world to initiate this nice project. And then um, the local leaders most often are not involved in those processes. And when you finish the project and you leave, the, the project tends to a white elephant. And so we need to also look at that. And then also looking at the enabling environment for private sector to, to strive is key, but investment incentives have to be geared towards host countries enjoying local content. Yes, um, again, a nice project comes to Africa and then um, we forget about the local content and then we tend to look at Facebook, Skype and all that. So I think some of these projects have to, have to be geared towards uh, some of the economic activities within uh, the, the locality, looking at the various sectors uh, of government. Number one, number one example is uh, agriculture. You know, agri employs about 70 to 80% of our population. So if we can uh, uh, initiate such project and then look at content related to agri, for example, a farmer sitting in the rural community doesn't need internet to browse Facebook and all that. The farmer needs a local content. For example, a farmer goes to farm, uh, the farmer plants a crop, the crop grows, and then there's a particular disease affecting that crop. And then the farmer doesn't know anything. So what can a farmer do? So if there, they, if there is a content, the farmer can just pick the phone, take a, a snapshot of that disease uh, of the plant, and then send to maybe a central server or something for analysis. And then the results come back to the farmer as sort in the local language. I think that we should be solving a problem. The other example is uh, uh, we are all talking about food securities. Farmers do their produce and then they don't get buyers to buy the product. So if the network is there and a, fire, a farmer can use the network to locate a buyer, we should be solving a problem within the developing countries. So we should not be thinking just, uh, we should not be thinking just about the community network, but then we should look at the various economic activities of those communities, health, education, and, and all that. Um, so I think that's uh, what I have to say. Uh, thank you. That's one last, thank you. Uh, that's one last uh, uh, in the room, if you don't mind. No, please, please. Uh, we have a, a schedule with a, another hands here in the in the Zoom room. So please go ahead with the, with all this uh, process in, in in an hybrid format. And please, uh, if we can, me, if, if I might ask you if your question go more quickly to the, to address all of them. So we need to go to a Uganda remote hub that has. She's hand up for some time, please. So I go ahead or I just sit? No, just please uh, wait. Okay. Go ahead, Alan Magesi, Uganda Remote Hub.
we can't hear you. Do you have a question or not? Please. I think it's still on mute. Oh, well, well, we can't you. hear you now. Yes, yes. I think uh, the, the mic the mic was unmuted. Um, th thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, it is important that uh, we understand the context of our uh, of our discussion uh, this morning. Firstly, my name is Alan Magezi, and I'm joined in from here in the remote hub in Uganda. And I'm liking the fact that uh, we are having our conversation mainly concentrating around uh, um, building capacities in respect to how we can attain meaningful access. And, and, and if you realize most of the speakers, uh, we are mainly focusing around community networks. So this is evident that the community networks are playing a very quite important role in building the capacities uh, so that uh, different communities have meaningful access. But then my question is then, is then how is the ground level for these community networks? Of course, by nature, community networks are non-profit organizations. So if, if a community network has to uh, fully impact its agenda, how, 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 do you, how do you then lay out that ground in respect to other big budget companies that are running profit kind of um, uh, sessions? In, in, in the brief, I just want to think that if, if we're looking at how we can uh, help the community networks, then we should focus two major aspects. One is um, the necessary regulations and, and, and uh, policies needed when, when these uh, community networks are doing their work. Um, the other is that, that the affordable and the necessary infrastructure. Of course, uh, putting in place uh, infrastructure is quite uh, expensive for these community networks that really don't run big budgets. So I think our discussion we're having, I personally come from um, the Internet Society, but Uganda chapter. So this whole year I've been engaging with, uh, with different service providers on how we can cost share in terms of infrastructure. How do we, how do we for instance, um, share the, the, the backbone, the, the, the fiber, with the community networks that at least the, the, the community attains meaningful uh, connectivity and as well access. And the other is uh, the rightful policies and, and regulations. For instance, if I quoted Uganda's case, the Ugandan regulator, the telecom regulator, that is Uganda Communica Communication Commission, requires any community networks in the country to pay a license of 2,500 US dollars. And, and, and that and that was we are thinking it is a quite a huge amount for a community networks to that is just starting and, and is running a non-profit session. We think that is a big one, and, and I feel uh, as a global conversation, we think that um, some of these regulations should be tailor, some sort of tailor-made, some sort of customized uh, in line with the kind of work each each, each service provider is doing. Uh, lastly, the other is in terms of um Actually, now I'll come to the, the, the session. I think Rhonda from ISOC put in place of how ISOC has really run different sessions in terms of building capacity. And she highlighted the fact that uh, we are running different courses. Yes, it is true uh, that ISOC, and we want to upload ISOC for that, that uh, several uh, ed education, especially e-learning has been affected. But then um, in, in respect to that, uh, we are co continuing the discussion in regard to multilingualism, different content in different languages. And still to add to that, ISOC, I think, has been running uh, a webinar series in regard to how you can access your content in your local language. Because we believe so, so some, some of the content being accessed is, is in uh, a few languages. Why should I have, why should, why should I be limited out uh, on, why should I have, go, why should I have to go to a different kind of language to access content. For instance, if I'm here in East Africa, I can access my content in Swahili. If, if, if I'm in Portugal, I can access my content, local content in Portuguese. If, if I'm in London, I can access in English. So that is the kind of discussion we're trying to build on. And, and we want to thank ISOC, uh, that is Internet Society, for pulling too much resources in terms of um, human resource, in terms of uh, finances as well, it has really devoted all, all it can to make sure that at least enough necessary capacity has been built to attain meaningful access and connectivity around the globe. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks a lot, Alan. So uh, 
Akin Tun Seriki. And uh, the question in the room, and we need to finish the questions to answer some of them. So please, uh, Akin Tun. Hello. Um, it's good morning here. Um, good afternoon, good evening, everywhere you are. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, my name is Akitunde from Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria. And uh, I'd like to just say I'm actually a very new member of VISOC and uh, I'm just trying to find my way around it. So my question is, uh, some of my questions are really going to go towards uh, ISOC itself uh, and other areas. Um, the very first question is to ask, um, especially for societies like ISOC and even ITU, um, for someone who is probably just uh, looking around in his environment, like in Nigeria, for instance, or anywhere in Nigeria, looking at communities where you know you could develop um, a community network, and you really want something like this to to yeah, start, yeah. and you really have no uh, direct access to probably any major organizations or anything like that. What are the step by step? Uh, um, 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 guide or guidelines you give for somebody just coming in and looking to say, okay, I really want to, uh, I think a community network is going to benefit uh, communities around me. What uh, are there a kind of step-by-step -step guidelines for somebody just coming in? What does it need to learn? How would you say, okay, take this step, uh, connect with this person, connect with these people, and then, you know, go from there to really uh, getting to the point of uh, where, you know, where RISPA is at the, at the moment, and then, you know, getting to really establish uh, a community network that can, that can really help. Uh, that's one question for both, um, I think, Rhonda and Roxana. And then um, I would also like to build on what uh, the, the brother from Ghana said. Uh, it's, it's really a case of really tailoring solutions in community, uh, in community network development across uh, different areas to their local experiences. Even within a particular country, different regions have different uh, needs when it comes to community networking. And I don't know if um, these uh, the, the big organizations are actually really looking at that. Like, for instance, most of the developing countries uh, generally need uh, uh, capacities uh, building that tends towards helping them to not just use the internet, but actually uh, for social economic uh, uh, resource, uh, uh, sustenance. So uh, I think a lot of our community networks should be moving towards or tending towards really looking at the problems each individual community is having and trying to solve those problems with the community network plan that they are having. So I don't know if uh, um, there are certain plans in place from these major organizations as well uh, in, to really adapt uh, development of community networks to different localities, each community. Do they, do you re, do they really, do you, how do you really look at what is the need and how to adapt uh, the, the idea of developing a, uh, um, a community network for specific communities uh, as well? And then uh, you have to look at um, your, the chapters or the different um, development uh, uh, set of uh, uh, being created across different countries. Uh, how do you really monitor, for instance, the Internet Society in Nigeria, does ISOC have a way uh, to really check on what they've been doing? Do you have a way to really know that there is an impact being made by having an ISOC chapter somewhere? Uh, uh, and do, is there a way that you really check and see that there is an impact being made, that you measure success, and try to expand on that. Uh, those are my questions. Thank you. And thanks a lot. Uh, some of the of the answers are right now in the in the chat. Uh, Rhonda help us with some of the guide you can follow, and uh, also there is my email, my personal email and my work email to uh, contact me, and I can share with you and contact with with other people if you want to answer them. We don't have time to answer all the, all the questions today because we have only one minute left. So if you want to comment the, the person in the floor who wants to, to address some topic, and we need to finish this panel, I'm sorry. 
So yeah, yeah, yes, uh, very quickly for the guy in Nigeria, because uh, my name is uh, Naza Nicholas from uh, Internet Society Tanzania chapter. And for the guy who is, uh, I don't know his name, but uh, he was asking about uh, the guidelines for starting community networks. Uh, I mean, you can visit the ISOC portal global. There are some information there. And also consider the issue of um, what happens if in your remote village, uh, there is a problem of water, what does the uh, villagers normally do? Um, they will come and you know, sit around the fire and uh, uh, try to find a solution for, for that. So you can do that uh, the African way. Uh, that is what uh, the community network uh, networks is all about. So you, you, you approach people um, and ask whether uh, internet access is the problem. So if it's the problem, you find a communal way of trying to address uh, that challenge. Uh, through that, I think you will be able to address the issue of avoiding uh, uh, the notion of imported menu uh, type of uh, community networks. Uh, I don't think I have enough time to be able to ask questions, but uh, we also uh, tried to implement uh, community networks in Tanzania in 2017. And I think the challenge has been the issue of uh, spectrum, uh, the issue of uh, policies uh, that govern uh, the, uh, the establishment of uh, community networks. And I was wondering uh, from the guy uh, who was presenting from Indo Indonesia, uh, what sort of uh, angle or approach uh, do you uh, employ to be able to, you know, to get uh, the police makers on the table to, ac to, to accept the issue of having a police framework for the, for the community networks? Uh, because uh, it has been a very challenge in Tanzania because uh, most of the uh, telcos are the ones who are getting the, the access to the spectrum. And I was wondering, I mean, what, what angle or what uh, approaches are you using to be able to get uh, the community networks, you know, licensed uh, given the amount of uh, money that you have to pay for the spectrum? Thank you. Thank you, thanks a lot uh, for, for your question and your comment also. Uh, I forgot to mention that there is uh, Nils, Nils Brock, who are in their phone right now, but he is from Lognet Initiative too. So you can talk with, the, with him, uh, the people who are in Poland uh, to go in deep to the, the topics about community networks. And also uh, there is a, a panel tomorrow of the, the NEMA Coalition of Community Connectivity, uh, who will be addressing some of the issues that uh, you are asking for uh, here in your questions. And uh, for the last uh, uh, minute, uh, Risper, you, do you want to, to share some things? Yes, um, thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, this is just to respond to uh, the question from Sean uh, quickly. Um, so how we are engaging other, com or how we want to make the uh, other community, um, other people to um, maybe own or start their own community networks or engage uh, other community networks in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Number one is through the National School of Community Network, which is supposed to uh, build a national consortium of community networks. And this will, um, uh, enable our um, uh, like uh, give us a stress one voice um for instance in um um when we want to uh, maybe have conversations with the government or even like uh, the recent uh, scenarios where we got a framework um that was because there was one voice of community networks raising certain issues so it helped us um uh, invite other community networks in this space and also um talk about our challenges uh, with one voice. And then there is also the element of documentation. So what we've realized is that um, many CNs are doing things in silos. 
So there's a lot of uh, content. There's a lot of uh, um, initiatives that are already ongoing, but no one knows about them because they're not well documented. And so uh, uh, you find people are just replicate, or science are just replicating energies. So how about um, uh, documenting the processes? Um, well, uh, maybe through videos or through curriculums as what the training is all about. Uh, so that uh, even when we're inviting other um, passionate um, individuals who want to start their own community network, there's already a strong guiding uh, documentation on, on like the processes or like even the experiences of other community networks that can be easily uh, accessed and uh, also um, easily used because uh, because it should be easy to also uh, easy easy and, and palatable to to the the users who are using it. Yeah, so I just wanted to share that on on like how we also are thinking to engage other community networks uh, or other people who are passionate in starting the same. Thanks, Whisper. Well, thank you all. Uh, we, we have no more time to, to, to continue this discussion. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I think this is really, really great. And uh, we, need, we need to continue uh, with these efforts to, on, to find ourselves and to uh, develop these training processes or capacity building processes to make another networks and to make another possible worlds uh, possible. <laughs> So thank you very much and see you in the next uh, occasion.